welcome to Film Crime TV. This is Chin Wax with the Old Quarters Club. I'm Julia Chin. In this program, we continue with our discussion on transaction monitoring. And uh, in the last episode, we talked about how and my concern about how we can train the machines and our people on how to do transaction monitoring. And uh, I'd like to continue now with the discussion on, especially in today's world, we see a lot of uh, uh, alerts that get thrown out uh, from the systems and how do I train my team? How do I scale the function on how uh, or, uh, to, to, to get them to, to get them to, uh, you know, be able to do we are nowhere near dealing with the practicalities of getting staff and kit to properly relate to each other. So um, let me start with Des. What are your thoughts on that about transaction monitoring? Yeah, transaction monitoring systems, um, the regulators often publish uh, examples of why companies were fined because they weren't the transaction monitoring systems were not effective for prolonged periods of times. Uh, even so far, with some of the larger institutions, despite the issue being highlighted on numerous occasions, um, any remediation to this can take a long time. So the moral for me, uh, the moral of the story for me is, it's not necessarily get it right first time, but continually review what's happening with the uh, um, calibration, uh, appropriate calibration for the business activities and the underlying customer base. And again, going back to something I've mentioned before, that transaction monitoring system for anti-money laundering controls on transactions being processed, uh, the rules can be certainly be different than those for transaction monitoring systems that look at card fraud, for instance. Um, and I guess that uh, I've worked with many companies and I've probably got a list of things that I found that didn't help them to be efficient. Uh, and those examples could be useful for, for people to think about ways that one expects everything to be done because the tendency is that a lot of companies think the silver bullet is a transaction monitoring system and they're not questioning whether it's effective or whatever. So, for, for instance, the scenarios are not considered to identify indicators of money laundering or terrorist finance, finance yeah, terrorist financing, um, and those relevant risks, um, because they were not set out when new products were introduced to the business or countries of operation were introduced. There'll be different types of rules and sets to look at. A, a common failing. Um, a common uh, failing is regular testing and update of the parameters within the systems that were used to determine whether a tran transaction was indicative of potential suspicious activity. Um, again, the accuracy and completeness of the data being fed into these systems and contained within those monitoring systems may often, you, you need to understand what's going in before you can understand what's coming out. Uh, the data filters that are applied. Now, with fraud monitoring systems and card fraud monitoring systems, there are always limits and variances. And we talked about um, the number of transactions in X amount of times within 24 hours or something. Well, the fraudsters and the bad guys know all this. And it doesn't matter whether you set three transactions within 24 hours, whether you set a thousand pounds within 24 hours or whatever, they soon learn that. What we should be doing is looking at the variances in the uh, behavior of that particular individual or why it suddenly happens. A perfect example I can give you only uh, a couple of days ago, I had... Um, I, I, I have a couple of the fintech cards and I keep money on most of them. I needed to move out of one of these fintech cards, great, a big UK fintech uh, business, well known. And I wanted to move a simple amount of a thousand pounds 
out of that account that was in my name with fintech into my own bank account in my name because of the thing uh, the, the regulations that are going on now about application fraud uh, uh, um, and whatever i was asked three sets of questions before i could or before they would authorize that payment and it was about are you sure you're not a victim of a scam i wanted to scream at the app that i'm moving money from one named account which is mine to my own bank account which is mine the very bank account that i fund that fintech card from no thought no understanding of the client or the data that they already have is a perfect example fraud transaction monitoring systems many companies believe it or not still do post transaction alert monitoring they've got to stop it now the money's gone the frauds happened and because of this post transaction monitoring after the transaction's been gone through you're now creating significant alert backlogs and I found companies then found that they've got the new transaction monitoring system. They've got these huge alert back, backlogs. They recruit three, three more people because they've got the fraud, uh, because they've got the backlog, which defeats the purpose of the transaction monitoring. So what good is there is not in identifying suspicious activity after it has taken place? For me, only if compliance uh, department is performing monthly reviews of both systems perhaps you can understand the measurement of success and lastly just to finish for this alert scoring and prioritization uh, that assign risk weighted scores to these risk alerts for immediate review or for review within four hours or whatever would be the way to go about it and it would also identify redundant alerts where in some companies I have seen over 60 to 70 percent false positives on certain rules I'll pass that back to you to think about it because that's how not to do it but if you know how not to do it hopefully it will help you to be able to get better at doing it yeah when you mentioned about the black backlog it reminded me of a, a role that was in many years ago where the backlog of a request for information was as long as a one year and uh, every weekend the staff will have got to go back to review all these uh, alerts that were generated by the system so well uh, those were the days and I hope that it's not happening anymore and um, what about what do you think right Nigel I think it is happening and I think that we have to bear in mind why it's happening and why it should no longer be happening um, and this is an example of where, for different reasons than we've been talking about before, we are failing to understand the interaction between the people and the technology. And for that matter, between the transactions and the technology. When we think about money laundering alerts, they have been generated ex post facto. After the event, they are reactive, whereas with fraud, hopefully what we're trying to look for is something to be preactive. And this is why we have the argument i have the argument that anti-money laundering is wrong because we're always going to be reactive it should always be counter money laundering because we are looking at it after the event and what des is saying is absolutely right can in, in our anti-fraud alerts because it should be anti-fraud not counter fraud our anti-fraud alerts happening at the right time and the answer is no they're not but it could and this is all this all comes down to how transactions were conducted in the financial sector historically 20 30 40 more years ago where nothing was ever looked at to coin a phrase in real time we had checks that took three days to clear so that someone could look at it and decide if the signature was correct and checks were passed under eye which means somebody physically was required to look at that check before it could be approved. That's why you had to spay, you had to spend money on a fee for a special clearance. Now this is all terminology that probably 80% of our audience has never heard because they're used to internet banking. They probably have never used a check in many cases. 
they use card transactions. The opportunity to identify something that's wrong is hugely reduced in the way that the tech in the way that technology is delivering the same services as it has done for many years. So whilst the technology is being used to speed up the transactions, no one is developing the same speed of identification of problems, except we do still get credit card companies who will telephone you within 10 minutes of a transaction saying, did you do this? That's what we need to see across the entire spectrum of financial services, not just restricted to the one or two credit card companies that have invested substantial amounts of money in that. And I'm not talking about, about the networks, it's the banks that provide the cards that have that system in place, because the same card could be the same network card could be used from a different bank and they won't identify those transactions. This is where we could have very usefully have um, a government sponsored monitoring system, which everybody is able to use, subscribe to and reduce the costs. I know Mark will hate this idea because he will think of talking about centralization of data, but actually we're not talking about centralization of data for the customer, except where we're talking about about whether the transaction is unusual for that customer. But there is an enormous amount of, of transactional data which does not relate to the card holder. It relates to the other parts of the transaction. And that is something which can usefully be centralized. And then a second line to look at the card holder after that, which should be held private by the institution. Transaction monitoring is a really, really huge issue, um, whether or not it's in the banks or with the uh, fintechs and in particular, I feel that fintechs are quite badly hit um, in the sense that, um, you know, the bad people tend to have this um, notion that the fintechs being startups, they they would try to push the boundary, especially with money milling. Um, so, big issue that, um, Mark, if you had a to the regulators if we have a look bearing in mind that fintech didn't that fintech in the form that we talk about it today didn't exist 10 years ago that's true and then we've had competition amongst the regulators and i know they hate this because they, they, they told me they hate it singapore led the drive to the bottom and it decided that it was going to create its um, um it, it, its sandbox then it said we'll have regulation light and it let let fintechs out into the wild with virtually no controls in place and others followed it. Only recently has Singapore come out and said, we're going to treat fintechs like banks or more or less. That's what we needed. So Mark, if you had a magic wand, what would you change first in this uh, ocean? Um, the next thing about that would be actually the, the, the bit that we're not talking about. There are two parts. One is client behavior, what is unusual or what is um, for example, the um, demonstration that they're subject to a fraud attack, that really unpleasant phrase that they use of pig butchering, for example, in the romance fraud side of things. How clients behave, because there are examples of banks and institutions telling people you are subject to a fraud, and they go, no, 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 actually these people need the money, and even ignoring police on occasion. But the other thing that really, and this is a very UK specific grumble, is nobody polices fraud in the UK. And the fraudsters know it, which is why they are using the internet to launch more and more successful attacks against the bewildered, the lonely, the um, gullible, uh, the overworked. Anybody can be subject to a fraud attack and we've really got to try and help them. So if I had my magic wand, it would be to introduce reasonable skepticism into the more common frauds and how they are approached and how clients are victims of it. And the other one would be kicking the police until such time as they actually police fraud the way they used to. That, of course, isn't going to happen in my lifetime. But Des, did you have any thoughts on that or am I just being particularly grumpy today? No more than usual, Mark. No more than usual. Um, I, I think 
everything that we've talked about in this particular episode uh, you know the examples of what we can do the examples uh, of where things have failed to do with transaction monitoring systems uh, and machines trying to uh, provide the answers and uh, the intervention of human intuition is all very well one of the things that i also tend to relate to a lot of people is an old military phrase and i would apply that to transaction monitoring systems and that is that no battle plan survives contact with the enemy i'll pass pass you back to julia on that there's quite a lot to digest there on transaction monitoring it sounds like a simple topic but it's not we still haven't addressed the original question of uh, the relationship between staff and machines and i think this warrants a set the next episode to discuss this and for now thank you gentlemen 